room, but we're going to bring them back over here uh, so you can pick them up downstairs after church is over. I just want you mom, moms and dads to know that. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to join me in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. It'll be a little bit before we get there. Um, if you're with us for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, we're in a, we're in a series that's entitled A Biblical Church where we're just returning week after week, Sunday after Sunday, coming back to the Word of God, the written Word of God, to see what Jesus Christ desires in the church. Now, Jesus is the founder of the church. He's the head of the church. We're His body. Uh, He has redeemed the church with His own blood. Uh, He's the bridegroom of the church, which is called the Bride of Christ. And so we come back to see what Jesus wants in the church, not what I want, not what you want, but what does Jesus want in His church? Before we review, because it's been a couple weeks, before we review the the principles, I want to ask you to consider a question. If someone asked you to draw a picture of church, what would you draw? Here's a pen, here's a pencil. Draw church. I don't know if this is the first thing that goes through your mind, but uh, but something with a steeple and sometimes something with a cross might might be the, the first thing that comes to our mind, but is that the church or is that the building where the church meets because if we really want to draw the church then we would need to draw people we need to draw people who are talking to one another who are loving one another who are caring for one another praying with one another worshiping with one another giving to one another because if you if you took and showed the picture of a building with a steeple or a building with a cross to the early christians and said this is church they'd be quite confused it's a common it's a common thing for us as us pastors and and teachers of the bible to say well we should look more like the the early church but see the early church in the early church church had nothing to do with a a building In fact, one of the texts that we return to regularly as we talk about the church is Acts chapter 2, and I'm not going to read it, but we've referenced this passage over the last couple of weeks many times as we talk about what the early church looked like, and it has nothing to do with the building. Sometimes, I'm very guilty of this, but sometimes as we study our our Bibles, people will sometimes talk of it. It would be nothing better for us to get back to the ways of the early church. But I wonder how many of us really want that. (laughs) Imagine this. On your way out today, you're handed a piece of paper that says, next Sunday, we won't be gathering here, but here are 15 different addresses where you can go to meet with someone for church in their home. You get there next Sunday, and you're ushered to sit on the floor, as I would assume many people in the early church would have. And you're going to sing without any worship leader or any instruments uh, accompanying you and then the knocker is the guy picks up a bible and says and for the next uh, few hours we're going to talk about this next letter from paul yeah i think there'd be quite a few christians who really say i'd love to go back to the ways of the early church who if that were the way church was they'd be walking out I think a lot of pastors saying and don't don't get me wrong i know i know that many of you are here because you prioritize you place jesus christ first in your life and that's why that's why you're here but placing jesus christ first in their life is not how the early church lived they didn't give him first place they gave him their life as colossians 3 paul said you have died and your life is hidden with christ and god when christ who is your life appears you will appear with him in glory and paul was writing to a group of believers who didn't just give jesus first place but made him their life and that belief resulted in more than a weekly gathering with other believers that lasted an hour or two it interrupted their whole life it interrupted every day of their life every single part of their lives this this week i read a blog where an author stated that first century christians cling to a set of clung to a set of values that are radically different than the values held by most christians today and when i read that to be honest i i bristled at first 
But he went on to say, my intention is not to lay guilt or blame on on your conscience or to, to, to despair on Western Christianity, but rather to just raise the reality that if we were ever given a glimpse of what the first century church really looked like, most of us would choose to stay in our 21st century churches because it's far more comfortable today. Right now, and even Aaron mentioned it, we're, we're routinely hearing of persecution against Christians in Af- Afghanistan as that Muslim Taliban is strengthening its, its hold. And, and I've seen appear on Facebook this week multiple times a little bit of a dig at American Christians like, well, the Christians in Afghanistan are dying for their faith while, while Christians in America won't even show up for church on Sunday. And I know the intention is, hey, wake up, American Christians. And there's the reports, though, that while American churches are declining in their attendance, in their giving, and in their sending of missionaries, right now the, Af- the church, the Christian church in Afghanistan, is growing like never before. What is the church in Afghanistan? The early church that we read of in Acts, what do they have in common that, that America doesn't, the American church does not have in common? One word. Persecution. Because let's be honest, most American Christians are praying for the freedom and the liberty to just stay out of our lives so we could practice Christianity the way we want to practice Christianity. But when persecution comes, we have to practice Christianity now the way Jesus says to, not the way we want to. Which is why I believe it's been so important for us to return time after time, week after week, to the word of God, not to man's words. I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm just telling you that. I don't know how to lead the church. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fool when it comes to that. But Jesus isn't. He gives us the words. And so if I'm willing to study and understand and share, we can do this together. So we, we recognize that we're living in a different time and in a different culture, and even because of travel and technology, we really do live in a different world, but the world still has the same problem, and that's sin, and we still have the same solution, and that's Jesus, but we also still have the same commission, and that's to make disciples. So we're returning to, to understand how to do this as we've gone through this series, and we, we started, and I'll just be real brief, we started with worship and that the church exists for the glory of God. And built on that is the word of God. The the God that we worship has spoken, so we listen and we obey. And then we pray. We take the words of God and we learn about who our God is and we ask him to do what he wants, not what we want. We ask for his will to be done, his kingdom to come, and his name to be magnified, gloried, and hallowed. We do that by living out a biblical community as we pray our father give us our daily bread and god delivers to us how we can then through love and unity share with the church and as the church shares with such love and unity that is foreign to the people outside the church people want to know more which gives us the opportunity for evangelism as we proclaim christ to those who don't know christ and as they turn to trust him we celebrate these ordinances we we celebrate baptism as someone turns to christ and we clap and cheer as that public demonstration of that private decision is made and and then we take the lord's supper together as we remember in celebration of the death jesus gave so that we could live but then after that and we've spent quite a bit of time talking about discipleship We've talked about what discipleship really is, and in in Colossians chapter 1, we see where where Paul tells us what it is, and it's to proclaim Christ, and why we do it, to to make mature Christians. On the first Sunday of August, we passed out this this little little paper, and I know many of you weren't here, but but just to encourage people to, to spend one month with someone else in this church proclaiming Christ and growing in Christ together. And and the stories that I have heard have been so wonderful as people have said, I've been meeting with this person or talking with this person or we've, we've had a dinner together. Man, praise the Lord. Thank you for doing that. That was the first week of August. On the second week of August, we heard of Pastor Mark sharing his journey as a disciple of Christ. 
A journey that's leading his family all the way to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to lead the Encounter Revival Ministries. And on the third week of August, we heard from Pastor Micah bring a, a great sermon on discipleship and asked us over and over, how far are you willing to follow the king? Because discipleship says, you can't follow me, Jesus says, unless you're willing to abandon all. And we heard how Pastor Micah is, is preparing his family as a journey of his discipleship and following Christ. He's preparing his family to go to Poland with, with Ron Davis to proclaim Christ in a foreign country. But I love, Pastor Micah, how you wanted to make sure, and you, you and I talked about this a number of times, you told me you wanted to make sure that this church knew that people who move across the country or across the world are not greater disciples. And I appreciate you saying that. You're not a first-class disciple because you're going across the world. You are a disciple because you're following Jesus. And I love that. Thank you for making that so clear. But what if God's not calling us to go somewhere else? How do I know I am maturing in Christ? How do I know if I'm growing as a disciple of Christ. One immediate answer is, are you following the Great Commission? We can't be a disciple of Christ unless we're discipling because he's called disciples to disciple. So one immediate answer is, is there anyone in your life that you are proclaiming Christ to regularly with the purpose of allowing them to grow and mature in Christ? I mean, truthfully, if, if we're not making disciples where we are, what reason would there be for God to ask us to go to somewhere else in the world to not make disciples there either, right? But let's just say we really want to identify if I'm maturing as a disciple. How would I know? Is there a picture of what a mature disciple looks like? Like, be like this person or be like that person. I know occasionally in our, our deacons meetings, uh, someone's name is mentioned like, well, this guy's really following the Lord or this person's really doing this, this person's really... But is there, a, is there a clear picture in Scripture of what it really means like to follow Jesus? And for that answer, we're going to look in 1 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. Just, just to let you know, I'm, I'm going to be using behind me the NIV translation uh, because it's it's very simple and plain. Other, other uh, translations use some larger language, l larger unfamiliar words. And so in 1 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. He's a young pastor. Paul's giving him some specific character qualities of what to look for in someone who will be a leader in the church. Someone who is to care for the growth and the protection of young disciples. And so you think through this, would you ever ask someone to watch your children who is not a mature person? It doesn't matter how old they are. You want someone who's mature. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to give a description to Timothy of this is what a mature Christian would look like, someone who can help grow other Christians. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read the whole chapter, just so you know, it's 16 verses, number 1, first, verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. First be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. 
Those who have served well gain an excellent and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the pillar, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. That's one chapter where, where Paul lists all type of qualities for two different church leaders, an overseer, or depending on your translation, it may read bishop, overseer, bishop, and deacon. We'll talk about the specific positions later, but but. Was there anything that intrigued you about the list that Paul wrote? Because I want to share what caught my attention. We clearly see that God's Spirit does not move Paul to emphasize the talents or the gifts of the disciple, but their character. Now, don't, don't let me lose you. I, I really don't want to lose you on this. I know, I know it's a little bit not real exciting, but I think it's so helpful. Because this should open our eyes to the fact that God's lists are often different than our lists. The Holy Spirit clearly emphasized the, not the talents and not the abilities, but the character and the integrity of the disciples that would lead. I think the church needs to take note of that. Because to be honest, in our society, character and integrity isn't always attractive to people. And we would never admit that. We would always say character and integrity is very important, but let's just look at our political leaders over the last couple of decades. Even on social media, character takes a back seat sometimes to flashy actions. We regularly see these wonderful dates that a husband and a wife go on, but you know what we don't see on social media? Is a husband, is a, is a wife bragging on a husband who came in humble forgiveness asking to, be for, asking to be forgiven for words that were spoken unkindly or in anger? But which matters most in a marriage? The flashy date or the humble spirit seeking forgiveness? I mean, if Jesus were to live in this idea, this, this time of social media, no doubt his miracles would be plastered all over social media. But the majority of Jesus' life was spent quiet, serving, loving, teaching, not real flashy, in prayer with his father. But that's what we are supposed to do as mature disciples of Jesus, to become more like him. Could you imagine Jesus as 23 years old being on YouTube or TikTok as an influencer? But we follow those people. Sometimes more than people whose character does reflect Jesus. And so I, mean, I remember... I remember um, a couple of years ago as I was searching for a church and I remember reading so many different um, just job descriptions of what a church wants in a pastor. Man, it's, it's pretty incredible. I want guys who are gifted and captivating speakers who can preach the word of God boldly and move hearts and cast great visions and lead people into new heights and, and, uh, and faithfully pray and faithfully visit and follow up and serve and offer compassionate care and make hospital visits and devote time to diligent preparation and be rich in theology but not too deep and, and bring emotion and illustrations but don't be too boring and, and, and make sure it's serious because it's a, it's a very important thing that's, that's taking place and, and feed us for a week but do it in 30 minutes. Like, I remember reading it thinking, who, who can live up to something like this? Sometimes we, I think sometimes as church members, we have this idea that, that those, those people who lead the church, 
They're like on another plane. They're like, they walk on a different level than we do. But here's my encouragement to you today. Every single character quality listed in 1 Timothy 3 for an overseer or a deacon is found in the book of Ephesians, which was written to every Christian. I'm going to go through them very quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time, and you're not going to have time to write stuff down, but I just want to show you. At the top, you'll see the, the description that was given for a deacon. And in, in yellow, you're going to see the, the description that's given to every Christian. For instance, a deacon should be a, a, an overseer or a deacon should be above reproach. And, and, but every Christian should live holy and blameless, right? One who holds the mystery of the faith. But in Ephesians 3, we've been given the mystery of the faith. And everyone should understand that. Being respectable and hospitable and but, but every Christian should, should live in a manner worthy of their calling with humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love. And someone who's not a recent convert, that, that's, that's a church leader. But everyone should be growing into mature manhood so that we're no longer children and should be able to teach, which is speaking the truth in love. But church leaders should not be lovers of money, but, but church members, every Christian, no longer steal and do honest work. Not malicious talkers, but every person, no corrupting talk. Temperate, self-controlled, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. In Ephesians 4, familiar passage, all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice, but be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You should have a good reputation with outsiders, and every Christian should live in a way where sexual immorality and purity and covetousness isn't even named among you. Not given to drunkenness, and boy, as a church, we're called, don't get drunk with wine. Faithful to his wife, and every Christian should love his wife as himself. Manages children well. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Do you understand this has huge implications? And here's the implication. Jesus Christ expects every believer to be maturing to a point where you would be qualified to serve as a leader in this church. Everyone in this, everyone in this room should be growing and maturing to a point where you would be qualified to lead in this church, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I realize that God's not going to call everyone into church leadership just like he doesn't call everyone to, to go to Poland. But there should be a time where someone's reading through 1 Timothy 3 and your name pops in their mind because the qualities that they read remind them of you because that's what a mature disciple is, which, which helps us understand spiritual leaders in the church are simply mature disciples. But every disciple should be on the path to maturity. Already? Man. <laughs> I better hurry. <laughs> Sorry. That was my 30-minute warning, right? Uh, <laughs> according to my timer, I've gone 23 minutes, Joey, so uh, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> So you can't miss the fact that, yes, you have three pastors. Your three pastors, I believe, have a God-given call to serve as a pastor. But it doesn't make us any different as Christians than you. We are all called to live and be the same. And I, I want to point out a couple more passages, and I know the time. I, I'll, be, I'll be as quick as I can. <laughs> I've, I've, got to, I've got to feed you for the week, but I've got seven minutes to go, right? So uh, if, you have, if you want to join me, you can. We're going to look at three other passages. I'll have them behind me if you just want to watch. But Acts chapter 6. So in Acts chapter 6, it's the passage that most people would point to as the, the institution of deacons. The word deacon, the English word deacon is not used, but the Greek word for serve, diakonos, which is where deacon comes from, is used in this passage multiple times. But, but here's, here's the, well, let me just read it, and then I'll show you why I think it's important. 
In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, In those days when the, disciple, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic, that's Greek, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebrew or Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, that's the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you, here we go, who are known to walk on clouds. Oh, no. Who are able to quote the entire Bible. No, no. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Essentially, seven men from the church were selected to meet two needs. There was unity in the church that was being threatened, and there were some special people in the church, widows, who were needing attention. And the apostles said, we're going to serve the whole church by continuing our ministry of word and prayer, but choose seven men from among you, seven men from among you to care for this need. And, And here's what you need to look for. People who are full of the Spirit. And of wisdom. Would you be chosen? Why not? There's, there's nothing great right there. That's the first seven, de- first deacons in the Bible, which is full of the Spirit, which means they're in tune to what God is leading them to do, and they react with wisdom when God moves them. And let me show you another passage in Titus chapter number one. Titus is, is similar to Timothy. Both of them were, were understudies of the apostle Paul. And, and, and Paul's going to write to Titus. He's going to say, put elders over the churches. And he's going to say, and here's what you should look for in elders. Titus chapter one, verse five. The Bible says, the reason I left you in Crete, this is Paul speaking to Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and those who, ref- those who oppose it. It sounds similar to what we read in 1 Timothy 3, right? But it's such an interesting list of qualities. When you choose someone to teach the word of God, to shepherd the people of God, and to oversee the work of the church, you're not looking for someone who can preach in a way that crowds are moved. You're looking for someone who loves his wife and children. But who do we want? You're not, looking for, you're not looking for someone who has a visionary mindset that stirs hearts. Uh, you look for someone who's got a kind, hospitable spirit and an honest, holy reputation. He doesn't need to have a divinity degree, but he needs to have a knowledge of the Bible that can encourage others and recognize false doctrine to protect the church. There's nothing miraculous here. Looking for men who go about living like Jesus. There's one last place I want to take you. A list of qualifications for church leaders. It's in 1 Peter 5. And 1 Peter 5 is is written by the Apostle Peter. And you can't forget who this guy is. He was the one who was always shooting his mouth off. He was always the first one to talk. But this letter is written near the end of his life. So this isn't bold Peter. This is mature Peter. This is Peter who no doubt has suffered persecution. Now he's going to write to church leaders. And what do you think he would say? 1 Peter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Wow, that sounds humble. And a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds 
of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Whew. Be a good shepherd, is what Peter says. But do you remember what Jesus said to Peter in John chapter 21? After Jesus resurrected and he met his disciples on the shore and he said to Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes. What did he say? Feed my sheep. So Peter was just like, hey, guys, be a good shepherd. And serve the people that God has given you not because you have to, but because you want to. Take care of Christ's sheep. That hardly seems to fit the qualifications that many elders or le- many elders or pastors that w- what what church is seeking them today. But again, I, I come back. These passages should help us see that your church leaders are not spiritual giants. They're just mature disciples who have obediently answered Christ's call. So that leads me to just, as we finish, are, are you a mature disciple in Christ? Because here's what you can't say. Oh, but I'm not a church leader. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a deacon. No, no. That Remember, we, we went through Ephesians. And when you read 1 Timothy 3... That's what every Christian should eventually look like. See, Jesus is not expecting only your leaders to be mature disciples. He's expecting every single one of his disciples to be growing daily more and more into his image. So if you would say, yes, pastor, I am a mature disciple in the church, then may I ask, who are you helping to mature into a disciple like Christ? If you're mature, then you've got to be maturing someone else. But if you'd say, to be honest, Pastor, I don't think my life would be really defined by what we read today in 1 Timothy 3. Hey, I've got great news for you. <laughs> Jesus doesn't leave you to figure it out on your own. The process of discipleship always takes two. Disciples make disciples. And Jesus provides the pattern and he provides the the power if you're just willing to say, I want to grow and I I want to mature. And growing and maturing in Christ comes down to daily looking at and becoming more like Jesus. And no no passage has helped me understand this more than 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face Listen, beholding. That doesn't say we're striving to do something. We're looking. We're beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. The more we look at Jesus, look at Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. See, we don't become more loving by just saying, I'm going to wake up today and love. No, we become more loving when we open up the word of God and we say, look at the love of our Savior to me. I'm so undeserving of this love. I'm going to allow his love to me to overflow out of me to others. We grow in grace, not by saying, I'm going to have more grace today. I'm just going going to do it. No, no. We have more grace today by digging into the word to see his grace to us, which then overflows in grace to others. I was was working on this this week and I just thought, Lord, come on. I've read discipleship books a lot recently. How can I just be honest with the church and just say, this is what's helped me. And so I, I feel like I've grown in the, in the Lord a lot. And that's not, a, that's not a brag. It just shows you like how far I had to come. I feel like the Lord's done a great work in, in my life and I've loved enjoying it. And 
I just tried to look back, like, what was, what was it that changed in my life when God really started working in my life to see, for me to see growth? And it, this isn't anything from a book. This isn't anything from me reading what someone else did. I just, just want to share that. I think this is, this is what happened to me. I began to daily look at Jesus in the Word. Not just read the Bible. Looking for Jesus in the Word. And then listen to Jesus in prayer. And I don't, I don't mean I stop and shut the Bible and say, like, dear Jesus, now here's what... No, I don't mean that. I mean, like, trying to live in tune more to listen, to pray, not just at one place with my head bowed and my eyes closed and my hands folded and on my knee. I'm talking like just in the day, just talking. But then, then this next part is huge. I would look, I would listen, and then learn to share. Right, man? This is, this is one of my guys that we're, we're discipling one another right now, me and Jason. This man is reading the Gospel of John and sharing with me what he's getting out of the Gospel of John. And I'm reading the Gospel of John and sharing with him what we're getting out of John. And have you grown? And I have grown from what you have given to me. Share with someone. It's one thing to hear it, but if we don't speak it, it's going to stay here. We got to start speaking it. But then, not just that, listen. Does someone share Jesus? And I don't mean like on a podcast, and I don't mean a preacher that you don't know. I'm talking about the person you share Jesus with. Listen to them share Jesus with you. And then look for ways to live more like Jesus. We want to end up at the bottom looking for ways to live like Jesus, but if our minds aren't in tune to look for Jesus, look at Jesus, to speak to Christ, to share with someone, to receive from someone, we're going to struggle to live it out. So if I could just encourage you, find someone. That's why discipleship is with someone. Find someone that you can grow together with in Christ. To become the mature believers that God wants us to become. And one day someone's going to say, hey, I turned your name in for this leadership position in the church. And you're like, me? Well, yeah, I mean, you look, look and you're going to say, I, I've grown like that. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I know that. God's been good. When people sometimes meet me at the back door and say, hey, thank you for this, that. I'm like, I don't even, I don't know how you can get some kind of truth out of this mouth and, and this brain, but man, can the Spirit of God do work when we turn ourselves over to Him. That's what I want to encourage you to do. Go with someone to proclaim Jesus to one another. You might be surprised how that process of maturity and discipleship grows which leads us to what leadership in the church is all about. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I thank you for, for who you are, Lord, for, for what you've done for us. And man, God, just I, I rejoice in my own life. I rejoice in, in God, what you have done in, in me. And, and man, I, it's, it's been so neat to be able to see, Lord, people in this church investing in, in the lives of one another, but through the person of Jesus. And Lord, I, I pray that you, would, that you would move hearts to, to do more than just sit in a seat today, but to say, I, I want to grow in Christ. Leadership in the church is not the goal. Maturity in Christ is the goal, but it's mature disciples who are called upon by the church to lead. Lord, we have all kinds of men and all kinds of women here, Father, who I know that you understand the servants that, that they are and how you want to continue that growth in their life. Thank you for giving us glimpses of one another just in the way that we serve one another in this church. Now, getting to hear from Jack and Sharon as you've 
worked in their life to the point where they've given their life to go to the Philippines. Pastor Micah and his family have given their life to go to Poland, but, but Lord, every one of us here can go to the people that we'll get to see tonight or tomorrow or this week. Lord, may, may we pause to look at you each day, to regularly listen as we speak to you, to take what we see as we look and share it with someone and then receive what they've shared. And then we just look to live that out, to be more like you. Father, thank you for making it so clear. Thank you for, for the example that Jesus is. We just look to Jesus and we behold him and his glory starts to become part of our life. How may we be those kinds of disciples that want to serve and follow the king with others. In church, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I would just love for you to consider what is it that God's asking you to do? Are you content? Are you too content where you are right now? And is there someone, is there someone you can grow with in the church or some other Christian that you can grow with daily? And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can't be a disciple until you become a child. A child of the King. A heart that says, I cannot save myself. I'm not Lord of my life. I turn that over to Jesus. When we do that, then we get to start following him and becoming his disciple and maturing in who he is to become more like Jesus more and more. Lord, I don't know what you want to do in hearts, but I pray that you have a freedom. I pray that people invite you. I pray that this church would care for one another so that we can grow as a 